Hi there, my name is Father Francis McKee from Pierrefonds, Quebec, New Montreal. And this is my third little YouTube on the book of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, for class I'm offering to my parishioners, and you're very welcome to participate. So you can listen to the other two to get to the background of it. But uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of the book <coughs> of the Apocalypse, um, how it's kind of put together. But before I do that, just an initial comment to recapitulate, uh, re recapitulate some of the stuff that I'd mentioned earlier. Uh, today, of course, during the pandemic, many people are using the apocalypse as a kind of a biblical crystal ball to uh, foretell the future and to name events and people who may be um, apocalyptic and revealed in the book of the apocalypse. And this is to abuse Bible, is to abuse the scriptures. The scriptures were never meant to be some kind of method for human beings to have control over the knowing the future. Uh, the Bible is not a crystal ball. It is a book of faith inviting people, God's people, to have trust in the Lord. That's what it is. It's an invitation to trust in God's power. And so, as I mentioned initially, the book of the Revelation is written to a beleaguered and broken church that's being attacked by the Roman emperors and uh, being deeply persecuted. And it's a book that was deliberately written in symbolic and uh, mysterious language in order to communicate to persecuted Christians uh, a message of hope, not to let go, to trust the Lord, because no matter what happens in and through history, God will always be there for us. And so those who try to somehow name names and suggest that the uh, fulfilling of the apocalyptic uh, intentions are being realized in such and such an event are simply abusing the scriptures and using it for something it was never meant to be. It's a foolishness and it's um, in deep, actually deep down, it's an attempt by human beings to try to replace God because they themselves now become the masters of trying to understand uh, historical events by uh, by somehow using God's word as a as, a, as an authority. Okay, so those who try to say the apocalypse is now being realized and that the end times is coming is all a bunch of foolishness. It was a very simple book written uh, to try to give Christians a bit of hope during a time that was very difficult. So um, the structure of it, and this will be my last YouTube on it because the next class I'm going to offer I won't require it. Uh, that you listen, you really have to read the book. You can't just kind of uh, follow some explanations. You have to read the scriptures. So I'll give you the basic plan of the book. First of all, there's this chapter one, two, and three is really what we call prophetic kind of literature in which the author of the book of, of uh, the apocalypse is speaking directly to priests or bishops of his time. Um, they are the various names, Smyrna, Pergamon, uh, Laodicea, and he says to each bishop, he kind of challenges each one. Some of them he says, gee, you're doing a great job. You're very poor. You're doing your very best with what you got. Wonderful. Hang in there. Don't quit. Uh, God will bless you. There's a few other bishops. Uh, the, well, the bishop, uh, when he says at the beginning of chapter 2 and 3, he says, to the angel of. That's a biblical way of saying uh, to the leader of or the elder of or the bishop of. Okay, So he's speaking to the bishops or leaders of particular churches and saying, you know, um, you know, you've been lazy, you're not, you've given up on the faith. In fact, you're compromising the values of the gospel. No, no, you know, watch out because you're in trouble. So this, this is the first three chapters. It's a basically strictly prophetic literature uh, given to the seven churches. Of course, it doesn't mean seven literally. It could be more than that. But seven, as we know from the last class, is an expression of complete perfection. And so he's really speaking to all of the churches around the world not just the churches of the time, but in a sense, the intention of the Holy Spirit is this message is for the churches for all of human history. So it's really a message towards your own parish and towards us, you know, kind of wake up, uh, let's get be committed to the Lord, and so on, so on. Okay, so that's chapter 1, 2, and 3. Of course, there's a bit of an introduction. And then we move into the... Um, the this, it's hard to know the exact structure, obviously, because... Uh, the writer of the Apocalypse may not necessarily have had a specific structure in mind, but we think he or she probably did. 
because it seems to break up into seven parts which say exactly the same thing, you know, exactly the same thing, but the message is very simple. The seven passages between chapter um, chapter uh, 4 right through to chapter 22, verse 5, uh, seven parts of it. First of all, there's the, uh, the, the seven, the, the heavenly court, chapter 1 to, uh, chapter, pardon me, chapter 4, verse 1 to chapter 5, verse 14, the heavenly court. And so kind of a, a vision of the heavenly court, but the message. And then the second one is the seven seals, chapter 6 to chapter 8, the seven seals. Now, a seal is symbolic of understanding or interpreting the deeper sense of living. And of course, when it talks about the seventh seal, who can open the seventh seal? It's referring, of course, to the fullness of explanation of the interpretation of human history. You know, And so it says, well, nobody can open that seventh seal. Who can open it? Everybody's crying. Who can do it? And all of a sudden, we hear a voice says, the Lamb of God will open up the seventh seal. That's to say that the word of God, Jesus come amongst us, the word made flesh, is able to give an interpretation and fulfill our understanding of the full meaning of our existence, you know, uh, which of course is captured in the death and resurrection of the incarnation, death and resurrection of the Son of God. And so the second section is the seven seals. The third one is the seven trumpets, chapter 8, to chapter 11 verse 9 and again the same message you know a trumpet's blowing and then this happens and that happens uh number then the fourth section the woman the child and the beast you know the woman that gives birth to a child and the dragon is there wanting to eat the child uh again same message life will be full of persecutions life will have difficulties there'll be trials and tribulations of all sorts you know, symbolized in the horses that we saw earlier, whether it's the black horse, death, or the, 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 the green sickly one means pandemics, uh, sicknesses, uh, cancer, whatever you name it, okay? And then the red one refers to persecutions of different kinds. Life will be full of different kinds of trials. That's just the nature of life. And so the woman and the child and the beast is the same message. The woman symbolizes uh, the church, of course, many people have seen that as symbolizing Mary. Of course, Mary being the mother of, church, uh, the mother of the church, in a sense you could say that, but that was not the intention of the writer initially. The woman is really re referring to God's people, the holy people of God who give birth to the Messiah. Eh? Give birth to, and, uh, and so the dragon, of course, wants the beast, wants to devour the child. Again, there's a constant struggle and challenge by the forces of evil. Uh, trying to uh, destroy the church, trying to destroy God's people. There will always be difficulties like that. And of course, as it ends, you see what was the victory. And so the, the pattern is the trials and tribulations, and then raise your eyes and you see the victory of the Lamb of God. Trials and tribulations, you see the victory of the Lamb of God. And so the same thing happens in the patterns of our lives, you know. Um, trials and tribulations, you go through them, you, go, you pass through them, you courageously move through the difficulties of life and you grow in sanctification you grow in knowledge of God you grow hopefully if you're a person of faith you grow in your love and knowledge of God and by the time you reach 80 years or 70 years 70 or 80 for those who are strong or 90 for those who are really strong uh, we hopefully will have relate, developed a confident relationship with the Lord and then with the next birth of the new next baby from the next generation, they have to go through the very same thing again. You might say that human history repeats itself with every new birth. Every new child has to relearn how to walk, relearn how to talk, relearn about how to deal with difficulties and contrarieties and, and struggles, uh, learn how to fall in love and how to deal with broken hearts and all that kind of thing, learn how to find jobs, lose jobs, be out of work, unemployed, uh, struggle with sickness, um, lose good friends, struggle with, uh, with old age, and then when the person hopefully through all that grows closer to Christ and closer to the Lord and grows in sanctification and finally prepares themselves for death, the next generation has to start all over again. You know, and so I often hear people say, well, 
don't human beings ever learn? We keep making the same mistakes. Well, of course we do, because each generation has to relearn the same lessons, or maybe they don't learn them. And so in a sense, that pattern of human development, of human life, is exactly what the book of the Apocalypse is doing. So seven times, St. Saint, Saint, uh, Saint John, or the writer of the book says, seven times he says, look, here's the pattern of life. Struggles and difficulties, keep your eyes focused on God. Struggles and difficulties, keep your eyes focused on God. And so the, he says it seven times. And so there's this heavenly court, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the woman and the beast. And then the fifth one is the bowls, you know, various kinds of bowls. Bowls become symbolic of pouring out of difficulties and problems. And it says at one point that it's pouring out of the wrath of God. And so people, some, some individuals love to just latch on and say, there you go. See, God is punishing us. He's, it's his wrath. No, that's, that's not the God of Jesus Christ. That's not the God revealed as the Father, our Abba. Uh, he is challenging us for sure, and through difficulties, we may somehow get a, a, a kind of a, a whack or a nudge, or, you know, wake up, get out of your, out of your stupor. But uh, the seven balls talking about the wrath of God is not true. It's, we're talking about, it's a, it's, it's a biblical way of saying God is trying to wake us up and shake us up, you know. And so the fifth one is the seven bowls, chapter 15 to chapter 16, verse 21. And then the sixth one is fallen is Babylon. Um, Babylon, of course, as I mentioned before in my earlier, is a reference to, to the Roman Empire, which was persecuting the Christians. Why did they use the word Babylon? Because Babylon has connotations for the, for the Hebrew heart. It refers to the exile when the Jewish people were under persecution by the uh, Babylonians and had gone through a terrible, terrible suffering of 50 years of exile. And so the, uh, this, this empire was seen in the, historically as the great enemy. And so, of course, Babylon is being referred to as all great nations or all, all, all empires which are trying to destroy others. In the case of the early Christians, we're talking about the Roman Empire, you know. Uh, if we were living in 1935, the writer of uh, the Apocalypse might have said, uh, said, Babylon is coming now to take over the world, and might have been referring to the German Empire at the time, because it was uh, the people themselves were not evil, but the empire itself was trying to do, you know, destroy under the leadership of, the, of Hitler and so on. Or you could think of, of uh, Stalin, or um, at the time of the... Uh, just after the Russian Revolution, you know, or there could be other names could come out today. So that's so that's it. So the heavenly courts, uh, chapter four to five, chapter five, verse fourteen. Then you've got the seven seals, chapter six, to chapter eight, the seven trumpets, chapter eight to chapter eleven, uh, verse nineteen. The woman and the child and the beast, chapter twelve to tw chapter fifteen. Uh, the seven bowls, uh, chapter 15 to chapter 16, verse 21. Uh, fallen is Babylon, um, chapter 17 to chapter 19, verse 10. And then finally, chapter, uh, chapter um, 19 to chapter 22. Uh, God has made all things new. It's a, it's a beautiful chapter, which kind of concludes the lovely book of the Apocalypse, where after all these struggles, he kind of concludes in chapter 22, the victory of the Lamb. And so we see the church, that is to say the church, God's people are coming down as a beautiful bride. The sea is no more. Of course, the sea symbolizes for the, for the Hebrew people, for the ancient people, because it was mysterious, the ocean was mysterious. It was, there was beasts in there. Uh, they didn't know what they were. They knew that they, if they did not swim, they'd die in it. And so the, the ocean was kind of a symbol of this. The sea was a symbol of, of evil and problems and fear. And so we see in chapter 22, the ocean, the sea is crystal, is quiet. There's no more problems no more wars, no more pandemics, no more of this. And, uh, and so we see the, uh, it's surrounded by 12 walls and all kinds of crystalline stones and so on. It's a beautiful image of the heavenly kingdom with God, where we're headed, you know. Of course, it's only symbolism. Who knows what heaven is really like? But of course, the author tries to depict it as best he can with the best language he can. So there's gold and there's nice colors and there's fancy stones and the gems and all kinds of stuff like that and uh, 
And as we finish reading through the various seven stages, there are seven repeated patterns of human history. We've seen the horses and you've seen the bulls and all that kind of stuff. Basically, the author says, all will be well, all will be well. You know, so it, 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 it's really a, a very simple book that says, as I said, it's with the, the introduction to the first three chapters, then seven patterns that are repeated over and over and over again. Human history will repeat itself. If you have any small children or you have grandchildren, they will go through the same struggles that you did. Not exactly identical, obviously, but they will have to struggle with relationships, struggle with taxes, struggle with losing work. They'll Who knows what they'll have to face in their life, you know? Every time I baptize a baby, I, in my heart, uh, as I pray for the child, I would say, Lord, be with this little girl or this little boy, because who knows what they will have to face through their 70, 80 years, whatever time you give them of life. Who knows what they'll have to struggle with? They may not have to struggle with the kinds of things that you and I have struggled with, but they may have something quite different that may be very surprising that we could probably not handle. And so the pattern of life is always the same, says says this thread of the apocalypse. Uh, Struggles and trials and difficulties. And so the pandemic we're facing today is really nothing new. I mean, it's uh, we haven't had a pandemic for 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 quite a number of decades, of course, but uh, these patterns come back again. We haven't experienced, for example, in North America, at least any major wars like they have in a number of Asian or African countries. But it might come in the future here. Who knows? The pattern is the same. There will be trials, difficulties, and challenges in life. You must raise your heart and your eyes to the Savior. You must trust the Lamb of God, who will be with us all through it all. When people, God's people are persecuted, struggling, God is always there to save us. And so this business about God is pouring out his wrath upon us. He's, he's condemning the world. Nonsense. God is our Father. And so the, leader, the, the, the writer of the book of the Apocalypse wants to kind of, he kind of wants to shake us by his language, shake us up so that we would really trust the Lord, you know, and walk with him. And so that's the, and so the epilogue um, at the end of the, of the book of the Apocalypse, chapter 22, verse 6 to 21, he just finishes by saying, now I've told you an apocalypse. I want you to understand that. I've told you through symbolic language how life is, is, is going, and uh, I want you to know that, that Christ, the one I've been, we've been speaking about, is coming back again. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, we trust him in all this. So I hope that these three uh, little talks on the book of the Apocalypse can dispel uh, some of the nonsense that you may have heard uh, from some individuals who may be speaking about it uh, uh, as some sort of an explanation of fortune telling or crystal ball fortune telling about what's happening these days. Uh, What's happening these days uh, is no different from the time of your grandparents, your great grandparents. They had their own struggles. We have ours. And all of this, the Lord allows in order for us to grow in what we call sanctification, to grow in closeness to the Lord, to trust him in all situations, even the most difficult, knowing that he is with us through it all. So the Lord bless you. Um, courage, I invite you to read. I've given you quickly the uh, the outline of the little book. You may want to re-listen to it and get the the actual chapters and take maybe one of these sections, just one of the sections, read through it, uh, reread some of the symbolism that I've mentioned to you. If you don't get all the symbolism, you may want to look at some uh, Catholic commentary commentaries on the apocalypse and pick out what the symbols might mean. Of course, we don't know all the symbols. We know some of them. But this book was written to a period of time uh, to Christians who would have known the symbols probably better than we do. But, you know, read through those things. And, 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 and if you have a good friend, as I said in the last talk, <clears throat> a good friend, <clears throat> why don't you get them to read that particular section and you close your eyes and try to feel the struggles, the difficulties, the fears, and also feel the wonderful victory as you hear about the victory of the Lamb of God. It's meant to be like an interior kind of movie. So I encourage you to try that. That's what I did with my Bible study in my parish there. 
had the folks kind of listening to it and, and living the experience in journey. So the Lord bless you. God is our Father. He's not here to destroy or condemn us. He's here to bring us with courage through sanctification and the grace of his Holy Spirit into becoming more and more the image of his Son. That's his goal. You're his goal. He wants you to become more and more imago dei, become the image of God, image of his Son. So the Lord bless you. Enjoy your day. And may this wonderful little book give you great hope. God bless you.